The battlefield of today is a shadow world of special forces soldiers who stalk each other without mercy. These highly trained teams are often the first boots on the ground when diplomacy fails and the going gets tough. They come in early, they come in hard, and they come at night, because night is the killing time. This assault has been an exercise for a team of soldiers undergoing the tough training the original Special Forces unit took back in 1942. History remembers those men as the first Special Service Force, but Hollywood called them... The Devil's Brigade. The movie created the myth. These soldiers are living the reality. For the next month, they'll train and fight the way the Devil's Brigade did. Hey, come on, you're under fire. And if they think being a soldier in 1942 was easy, they're in for a shock. You're under fire. Come on, engage. Do not interfere on the range. You understand? Oh, kick your. I tell him to do something, he does it. Their time in the past will be violent and brutal. Before it's over, one of these men will almost die. Four will be hospitalized, and two will go home. Those who tough it out will come to Europe to attempt one of the Devil's Brigade's most dangerous missions. The experience will be harder than the soldiers could ever have imagined. It will push some to their limits. Now we do it because we're all soldiers and we don't turn back or none of that shit. Because we, that's just what we are, we're soldiers. Using muscle, courage, and all their special forces training, the men will try to do what the Devil's Brigade once did. Overcome the odds and defeat a resolute and determined enemy. These men are not actors, but experienced German soldiers. And just like the Panzer Grenadiers who held this outpost 60 years ago, this squad is hell-bent on holding their position. On a spring morning in 1942, the legend of the Devil's Brigade was born here in Montana. One section, two in the middle, three on the left. These 15 men are all professional soldiers. They're men like Brian Haynes from Fort Benning, Georgia. Brian is a drill sergeant in the US Army. Haynes. One section, put your kid outside, where you go, next. Boucher. And Albert Boucher, a master warrant officer in the North Saskatchewan Regiment who has recently returned from Afghanistan. Boucher, one. Bert. 
Bird. Bird. And Chris Bird, a sniper from the Royal Regina Rifles, who also teaches unarmed combat. These soldiers, like all the others, are hard men who've led courageous lives. And just like the original Devil's Brigade volunteers who came here a lifetime ago, they have no idea what they're in for. I was completely amazed at the uh, destination. I had no idea when I volunteered for this unit that I would be heading for the United States of America. All we knew is that uh, we were going west somewhere. <laughs> off the train and you're about ankle deep in dust and <laughs> what on earth have I got into? <laughs> then when we saw all these different uniforms and everything, what's what going on here? We couldn't figure it out. Okay, welcome back to Elena. What you're about to take right now is the same training as they did in 1942-43. No surprise, you all qualified soldier and this is the way you're gonna be treated as such. You can wear your equipment as you see fit. What we're looking for is people who can perform with the equipment that they're given. The men of the brigade were both Canadians and Americans. This squad is too. Danny Hassel is a U.S. Ranger who's seen tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan. Jay Budd is the third man in his family to wear the Green Beret. Jay specializes in high-altitude free-fall jumping at night. Andrew Rowe is a tough kid from Nova Scotia who will soon earn the nickname the Fighting Fetus. And every unit has its rookie. Meet 18-year-old Kevin Hansen, a high school quarterback who's recently volunteered for the U.S. Army. I wish I was. The troops have been issued a standard 1940s kit. This kit right here is not the best. For Canadian Scott Young, it's a big change from what he's used to. It's so awkward, like it's, it's just difficult. Like we have brand new webbing and stuff back home, and tack vests and stuff, and it's just so hard to like adjust yourself and like. Scott likes army life. He won't like it in 1942. It sucks, it's very disappointed. It really hasn't, I don't know, it's really been a big disappointment. I've been really upset about the whole, time, the whole thing. The Devil's Brigade was born in the darkest days of the Second World War. As the Third Reich conquered Europe, Churchill secretly worried the German fighting man was tougher than anything the Allies had. Something special was needed. The Devil's Brigade was the answer. The British couldn't afford the cost of the unit, so the Americans stepped in. But few American soldiers had ever fought in the cold. Canadians had. A lot of us had never met Canadians before. We didn't get along too good with them right in the beginning. Not too great. Canadians pretty much in the yes sir, no sir. Uh, spit and polish type thing, and especially the guys that went to the force. The Americans were kind of a loose group. <laughs> the brass knuckled Americans. <laughs> the brass buttoned Canadians. The Canadians got paid less than the U.S. soldiers. Yeah, but you know what we always said? Americans couldn't play poker worth a damn. We straightened the money out after payday. And of course, just being from a different country, uh, started some bar fights. That really was, that was overplayed in that stupid movie. Uh, there really wasn't a lot of problem. Above everything else, it was the brutal training which broke those barriers. Whether you came from Texas or Toronto was meaningless. Everyone double-timed around camp and was loaded like bullets in the back of a truck for another day of running the mountains. We had a lot of stuff in common, and you found those common things, and that's what broke down the barriers. U.S. infantryman fears only God and his own artillery. 
<laughs> Joe George has just returned from Iraq. He's volunteered for this tough training to learn from the past. We can't forget the lessons that are, have been passed down to us, written sometimes literally in the blood of soldiers. We cannot afford to forget those lessons. Then they took us over to Muscle Mountain, and that looked like about a 10,000-foot mountain to us. <laughs> you didn't make that one on the run the first few times. But... Look that way, Pine Mountain. That's where we're going. The one with trees on the right-hand side, that's the one. Two jerrycan per section. First section to the top, must wait for the other two to arrive, OK? Special Forces soldiers, like many of these men, consider themselves the best of the best. They say weak links simply don't exist. Today, they'll find out if that's true. Hey, it's going great. Life is good. We're going to find out if I'm as hard as my grandfather. Running up this mountain, Carrying jugs of water was something every member of the brigade did on their first day of training. How's it going? OK. The way it was put, you want to get out of this outfit, just don't finish doing what you're supposed to be doing, and you'll be gone. Well, nobody would drop out. I ached. <laughs> I ached for a while until I got to... I got uh, accustomed to it, and then it just sort of didn't bother me anymore. The jerry cans of water, the heavy gear, and the thin Montana air all take their toll. However, these are elite soldiers who've climbed mountains in Afghanistan, hunted killers in Iraq. They've seen a lot worse than this and everybody makes it to the top. Take a look around, guys. That's beautiful. Almost worth the climb. The technology of war may have changed, but the essence of being a soldier has not. Respect is earned, not ordered, and you work hard to prove you belong. If the training is tough, you had better be tougher. The whole thing in the training was, I'm going to make you quit. And the answer was, like hell. OK, listen up. We're going for a four and a half to five hour walk. Kit is fairly light. We probably got in there average of 35 to 40 pounds only. That's your first one. The weight and the distance will increase as we go along. They took you out on a 25-mile route march to and say, this is just conditioning marches. There had never been a unit like the first Special Service Force. Three regiments, almost 2,000 soldiers who trained like commandos but fought like partisans. Designed to operate behind enemy lines, the men were selected for their unconventional skills. Cowboys, farmers, street-tough city kids. If you liked a good fight, you were the brigade's kind of soldier. Training was very rugged and very tough, very tough, and, and very, uh, a lot of it. It wasn't just a little bit here, a little bit there. It was training every day and every morning and every night. And we got toughened up pretty good. It was tough. Uh, I'd been through some pretty tough training. Parachute training was always tough, but uh, uh, this, uh, I think, was about at the upper end of toughness. Uh, it certainly put us in condition for anything that was to come next. The men took the training in stride, hiking hundreds of miles across the Montana foothills. Although the instructors tried to break them, in an age of guts and glory, no one wanted to be called a quitter. It wasn't so much it was the training, it was the stick to it of us. That's what was important about the training. And of course, physical conditioning and you know. Tough men need an even tougher leader. 
Lieutenant Colonel Robert Frederick was just such a man. We just idolized that man. He was a real, highly qualified officer of great ability, outstanding intelligence, uh, and great bravery, personally. When Frederick took command, he requested two things, a specially designed killing knife and a stockpile of enemy weapons. He got them both. Frederick knew a large force operating behind enemy lines would be difficult to resupply. So he trained his men to fight with German guns. Crack it back, that's it. Now get the hang. Crack, squeeze the rounds off. Good marksmanship. Stop the round. The Mauser. Okay. The Luger. The Schmeiser machine pistol were standard Wehrmacht weapons. The Schmeiser, in particular, was a favorite of German paratroopers. It had a light trigger. Hey, hey! Whoa, 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 what was that? But there was one Wehrmacht weapon feared and admired above all the others. The MG-42 machine gun. 1,200 rounds a minute, accurate over half a mile, and weighing less than 25 pounds. The MG-42 was a simple, reliable killing machine. Yeah. That's a great gun. <laughs> but it was a lot faster than our Browning machine gun. Oh, much different sound. Uh, the rapidity of the... Uh, Firing uh, was a dead giveaway. The brigade had a great weapon of its own, the Thompson M1 submachine gun. The men called them room cleaners. Oh, the Tommy gun was everybody, most, a lot of the guys wanted that because you could spray a pretty good path with that thing and it, a lot of guys had it. I thought to myself, wow, Tommy gun, uh, Al Capone. <laughs> Introduced in 1921, the Thompson was a crime-fighting submachine gun. Knock him down and he'll stay down, the ads boasted. But at $200 each, the Thompson was too expensive for most police departments. So the military bought them. Angelo Godola, a sergeant in the U.S. Army, has fired many weapons. He says nothing beats the Thompson. Firing the 45 caliber Thompson is one of the best experiences to do. Uh, ever since I was a kid, you know, you carry around that toy gun and you're hoping to get a chance to shoot it someday, and this is the first chance I ever got to have it in my hand, so it was great. For the men of the brigade, the Thompson was no toy. They'd soon be facing an enemy which had conquered nations in weeks. They wanted all the firepower they could get. Chow time, and the troops eat well. The Devil's Brigade was probably the only infantry unit in history not to complain about food. Frederick ordered his cooks to either buy or steal the best food they could. We ate very well, very well indeed. Food was marvelous, absolutely marvelous. And, and the, the, the toughest part about the eating was you had to eat quickly and you had to have a long reach. Otherwise, you, didn't, you, were, you left the table hungry. Good food means good morale. And after a few days in the past, these soldiers are also a happy squad. <laughs> they ran the mountain, shot the guns, and think they can do what the old guys did without too much pain. But they haven't gone one-on-one -on -one with Bill Wolf yet. You need a wider angle, so you can block white, false. Okay, there's the knife trapped. Mm -hmm. Okay, take it off him. All right? <sighs> this is not going to be a good... Put your hands up. Drive into him. Put your hands on your head. 
<laughs> right there. <Key> stick. <laughs> you couldn't be a very good cook, okay? Meet Bill so Wolf, here, one of the meanest 60-year-olds around. Drive into the guy's chest. Okay, then you got his eyes with these hands. Wolf, a hand-to-hand -hand instructor in the Canadian Army, teaches what's called defendo, fighting dirty. If the guy's going gung-ho on you, protect, bust his legs. If he's got no wheels, he can't fight. He learned his trade from Pat O'Neill, the man who trained the brigade. Well, the hand-to-hand -hand combat was, was with Pat O'Neill, uh, and uh, it was his, his, his kick-and-poke method that he'd, he had developed uh, while he was with the Shanghai police. And he was an expert unarmed combat guy. He was a sixth degree black belt. He had a very simple philosophy. If you have a gun, use it. If you have a rock, use it. If you have a stick, use it. If you don't have anything, this is what you do. And what you did was forget the rules and fight like a Shanghai street cop. Because what you're thinking is fighting square fight, okay? You, what you got to do is get out of the boxing mindset, the sports mindset. If I go boxing, you bust my legs. The first thing he taught you was to close, never retreat, which is what your opponent expects if he menaces you. You got to close and take the guy out. If he's throwing jabs, whoop, 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 you're backing up, you fall in a fucking hole. Keep your hands up, cover, bust him. Take his lead leg out, break it. You're thinking sport. Got it? Practice. Let's go. Close the hole and kill. Uh, for, for me personally, because I was a kind of a mild, mild mannered kind of a, a, a youth, I had a hard time with that. I, uh, in the hand to hand combat, I, I was always the loser, you know? I didn't think I had it in me to, to do this sort of stuff, but I, after a while, okay. I picked okay. it up. I'm going to have to hurt him, aren't I? Back to his eyes again. Okay? Position. Nervous stuff. Up. Okay, eyeballs. It's, it's no sport at all, it's kill. And, and, it's, and it's your, how good are you at defense against somebody attacking you so you can be effective in killing. It's just that simple. Nice and simple. Grabbing left hand to his wrist, unarmed, pull. Get behind him, all right? This is called an arm drag. The purpose of it is to clear the front position, take his back so you can pick him up. All right, so nice and simple. In here, pause. Take him out, down. All right, working it off nice and simple. From here, one, two, pass. The dirtier it is, the better I like it. Got it? Right. Partner out, practice. Thank you. The from dirtier here. it is, the better I like it. And you take advantage of the Devil's Brigade way. And Chris Bird is about to find out exactly okay. how dirty that can be. Mr. Bird, get over here. Okay. Now, yeah, keep your stance, okay? When we're looking in here, eyes. Okay. Chris teaches self-defense and knows his way around yeah, a fight. Now. But he's not prepared for Wolf. In case you missed it, here it is again. Right finger, left eye, fight over. Okay? Get out of the... He's f***ing decapped now. Understand? Roger, right, son. Where his hands go? Face. Face. Right? Then you can take advantage of position. Okay, now you guys got to get out of the sports concept. This is brutal, savage, but they asked for it. We can take it and we can dish it out. Just do it nice and simple. Chris Bird got off easy. Kevin Hansen is up next. His hands drop, you can take position. Anytime the guy keeps his hand in a hut position, smack him here. Break in here. If you're too close, ball. Oh. Okay, and that was just a light tap. How old are you? 19, sorry. 19, my daughter's 21. That's why I practice on young fellas. <laughs> Hits to the temple, which could kill a man. Uh, hit to the nose up here, right under there, which would drive hard enough to drive portion, the nose portion back up, back up into the brain and, and kill an individual. What I'm working in here is his nose, see? I straighten him up. This gets into here. Rear naked and I kill him. When these legs come in, tap his nuts four or five times. Go like that with your heels in his balls. Go and hit his nuts. Does that feel good? No, sergeant. You're doing that. Where do you think his mindset's going? Out the window. To stop his from choking. Then you choke the out. Take out his right eyeball and feed it to that. 
just crossing your legs means when you cross four times in the balls, choke them out as you're doing it, poke out his f***ing eye. And do it! Get out of here, practice! Kill him! And if he resists, take his eye out! We weren't in a wrestling match. It was kill and maim, not hurt and shake hands. So to this day, none of us know how to do that. We're teaching them how to tactically kill the enemy using stealth movement and overwhelming superiority of mental attitude. The Devil's Brigade claimed they owned the night. Patience, stealth, and sudden violence was what it took to stay alive. All right, now, what I'm gonna show you is brutal, okay? It's not dog This is the real deal. It is, for most people, very repugnant, the fact that you're actually gonna practice killing. All right, and it takes repetitive training to break down the barriers to the concept of killing, okay? In the infantry, everything is about killing. It's quite a shift in uh, your thoughts and your feelings and all this thing to realize that, hey, you're gonna have to maybe kill somebody with, with your knife. Now, the philosophy is very simple. There's you and there's me. And it's going to be you, and it's sure as hell it's going to be me. That's all you need to know. In a close combat situation, you either kill the enemy or he kills you. That is the real deal, OK? And if you cannot find it in yourself to utilize that skill, you will lose in the real deal. Oh, yeah, we knew how to use it and where to use it. But uh, it's one thing to do that and use it on a dummy and another thing to uh, perhaps uh, sneak up on a German sentry and put your arm around his neck and, and stick him in the, in the uh, kidneys. I never worried about the, you know, the morality or the, any of that stuff. I just knew that I was coming back and I was pretty sure the other guy wasn't. First action, you can hold the knife so the blade's parallel ground, and you come in here. See, when I hit him, what happens to his body? Okay, that's the one side, here. Okay, that's the other side. All right, what's in this area right here? What's right here? Kidneys. I'd say I, any real infantry soldier has to learn how to use a, a weapon like this, because if it, if it comes to this kind of weapon, then this is all you have. If you're not, the people we're going against definitely know how to use one of these, so. All the training was done with naked weapons, naked bayonets, naked knives. We had the knives, and knives are very, very sharp. So he told you that getting cut was not a big deal. Getting killed was a big deal. You might get a cut, a superficial cut of some kind, but you were going to kill this person. When I come on the guy, in. We were taught how to down. come in back of, of a soldier, an enemy soldier, and pull his head back and yeah. cut the juggler. Mm -hmm. um, and or how to do that effectively by putting your knee in the back of, of the soldier and how to do it very quietly. You get it in and you bury it up to the thumbprint. In order to get out, you're going to go back and forth like this inside the guy, viscerate a big hole to pull it out because how many guys ever got it a goat? A deer. deer. What happens to it? It sucks on, so you make a hole, right? Eviscerate, pull it out. Damn, you got to love this, right? And most of these men do. Violence is their trade, and they can handle Wolf's casual cruelty, with one exception. Kevin Hansen is leaving. Something's come up, he says. I've got to go. These guys were tough. This equipment that they use is raggedy. It's by, by today's standards. I mean, if we were using our own equipment, this would be easy. And their equipment was raggedy, you know, all this wool and this heavy equipment, and these guys were tough, hands down. I mean, these guys had to be the toughest people in the war. Despite the best efforts of the program producers, Kevin went home at the end of the third day. The hand-to-hand -hand combat hurt him. Bill Wolf scared him. Too intense, too angry, too real. 
Yeah, well, moral of the story is don't send your sons and daughters off to war if you don't want them to learn it. Ready on the right? Right side's ready. Left? Stand by. Go! After months of being taught how to kill, the Devil's Brigade was literally at the end of their rope. These were hard men who had signed on for action, but all they'd had was endless training. Well, the, the, the rough training <laughs> encourages one to want to get out of the training and into the action. Rumors began to spread. A mission was in the wind. Well, we pretty well knew that we were going to uh, go to Norway. Allied intelligence had learned Germany was moving quickly on their atomic bomb project. Nazi scientists were making heavy water at a research facility deep in a Norwegian fjord. The Devil's Brigade was tasked to destroy it. Uh, that was Louis Mountbatten's idea. Same guy that was pushed the uh, Dieppe raids, too, <laughs> so... <laughs> the mission, called Operation Plow, was a mess right from the start. It seems to me it was a rather strange mission. Oh, I think it's the usual military screw-up. <laughs> Particularly since uh, the, the final plan to deposit us into Norway uh, had not been worked out. We knew it was a suicide mission. If you can imagine how dumb people can be, we knew it was a suicide mission. If you're going to parachute into a place like Norway and uh, you're going to ski and blow up a power plant, uh, which is defended by, by Germans who are very skilled in winter warfare because they've been fighting in Russia. Uh, this, and where were you going to go? There was only one place to go. If you were in the 1st Regiment, you would go to Sweden, except that Sweden didn't want you. Story may be right. It might have been a suicide mission. All I'm saying is none of us thought so. The American Army had built a prototype snow machine to carry men and equipment, the weasel. But with a top speed of 30 miles per hour and almost no armor, the weasel was every infantryman's worst nightmare. The vehicle we had, the weasel, uh, the only bomber that it could handle it was a Lancaster. And the Lancaster was under the control of the Brits, who did not want to trust their great new uh, bomber uh, to such a mission. Operation Plow was canceled when the Norwegian government objected to the plan. The resistance eventually destroyed the plant, and the Devil's Brigade was sent back to Montana. Squad, out the ready, advance! The only brigade members who'd seen any action were the Canadians who had fought in France early in the war. Then we had, we had battle drill training, which, which was imported from Canada, the Canadian Army, which worked very well for the Special Service Force. That gave us fire and movement, where one group is protected by the fire that's laid down by another group, and then when they're in their position, then that group moves up, so on. Enemy 12 o'clock! 75 yards! The brigade worked relentlessly on the fire and movement drill. On, Suppressing fire from one flank allowed the other to close on the enemy. Take a bad one, let's go! Fire and movement became the basic infantry squad tactic of the Second World War. Even today, it's taught at military colleges around the world. These soldiers have all done this type of exercise many times. But in this age of unlimited firepower, attacking an enemy position with only eight rounds in the magazine 
was harder to do than they thought. Hey, unfix it. Welcome to 1942. Wow. Boy, did we learn a few things, guys? Uh, yeah. I'd have a satchel bag filled with freaking grenades because I had six rounds left and I resupped over yeah, here on the right. I was done. I only had four mags to start with. Okay, so but, in other uh, words, you got to get a slower rate of fire to suppress when you're moving. You need to save it for the assault line so you can do suppressive fire, yeah? And yeah. the counterattack. And the counter. Okay, it's not bad. Everybody hold the hand, right hand out. It's shaking. Yeah. Yeah, mate, guess what that is? <laughs> Drilling. Drilling. It goes away after a while. All right. All right. All right. All right, gents, there's three issues we need to deal with tonight. We need to get the general feeling of the training so far. I know we only One week into training, so training, and the instructors are not happy. We're looking also at some schedule changes, and I have some concern about three individuals that I observed today. I'll bring up those. Three names. soldiers in particular have caught their attention. Big concern about Young, George, and Pierce. Young is the guy that apparently doesn't care about anything. Twice today I told him to fix his equipment and basically he told me that he didn't care and he got somebody else to fix it for him. And this word where well, I don't care, just fix it the way you want. He asked him where he wanted it on the belly, he said, yeah, I don't care. George is a tall one with the glasses. I think he's in three section. I would like you to keep an eye on him on two different occasions today. He wasn't on time, even though I gave them a 15 minutes warning, he still had his boots off and he just didn't care. He is slower than slow, believe me. I'm not saying slow mentally. No, I'm no, saying you I tell him to do something, shame, and it's just like 10 times today I said, five meters yeah. apart, five meters apart. And everybody, and I was like shoulder to shoulder with him, and I was purposely, and he was the only guy basically touching the rack sack or buddy ahead of him. I think we have a concern with this guy. The third one is Mr. Pierce. Maybe he just need a fire under his butt, but right now he's just not keeping up. Mr. Pierce is Spencer Pierce a tough kid from Toronto who joined the army after the police caught him rappelling from a bridge. Apparently the uh, first sergeant thinks I have an attitude, but lots of people tend to think that. Uh, we'll find out. Maybe he can uh, actually get to know me before he thinks something like that. To get Spencer and the others back on track, the instructors have decided to conduct a snap inspection. Joe, what detonated over here? Anything in there? That was a, a question, Joe. I got it. No. Did you get away with a rack look like this anywhere else in the military? It's negative, son. Okay, so we're not going to get away with it here, right? Roger. All right. I don't want you to be embarrassed. If have you wore those? Uh, no, sir. No, uh, I don't blame you. There you go. Yes, sir. May I take a look? All the kit is good to go. Or somebody else, sir. Okay. First, sir. All right, I got to ask. I've heard this nasty rumor about you having a, uh, electric toothbrush. I do have an electric toothbrush. Where on earth is that? It's over in the shed. Oh, it is? Okay, what are you using now? I've got a standard bristle brush. Okay. Well, outstanding. Good what for about you. your kit? Good for you. Um, the soldiers in this the camp got, all this hope to be selected for the Devil's Brigade mission in Europe. But the instructors have been told to cut anyone not measuring up. And Joe, Spencer, and Scott Young are in their line of fire. Guys, tell you what, what we're going to do now is we're going to talk a little bit about the mission for tonight. Um, basically, what our mission is tonight is an ambush. Uh, in this scenario, what we've got is we've got a two-vehicle... The squad has been ordered to conduct a mission the brigade did many times in battle. Ambush a convoy and kill the occupants. Moleskin Mountain, whatever. All right down here and come on up to the tower, okay? Uh, those two vehicles will be uh, lightly, uh, lightly armed, uh, only just a few individuals in it. So basically, we want both trucks destroyed. Uh, and whatever occupants are in there. They're coming through, I already said. The art of the ambush is in the planning. Danny Hassel, the US Ranger, has done this type of planning before. Go across the road, send two guys up. They go through, sweeping through bodies and all that. Staying together, though, man, because you never know who somebody might still be alive. I don't know if we're going to have to go up there and show you. Yeah, one searcher and one guy. Exactly, so one guy's watching. I like personally the same two that go up there are also demo guys. Just like in the force, you know they all knew that. So instead of sending everybody up there, the two guys that are searching are now demo guys as well. 
This will be the first time the group has worked together, and the men are focused. But the gods of war are fickle, and many a soldier has died on a simple mission just like this. There's always the unexpected. No matter how careful the planning is, it's sort of like defensive driving. You, you anticipate that the guy ahead of you is going to do something stupid, so you be ready for that. In 1942, this is what the soldiers would have seen as they set up their ambush. But with the low-light lenses today's special forces use, this is how the same scene looks. Danny's plan is to divide the convoy and assault each vehicle individually. So an explosive charge is laid across the road, primed to go off as the first vehicle passes. Approaching the trap, an armored personnel carrier, and a truck with a 50 caliber machine gun in the back. From the outset, things go wrong. The charge to separate the vehicles fails to go off. The convoy does not stop. It's time for plan B, only there is no plan B, and the chaos of war ensues. Even though the weapons are only firing blanks, it's clear the machine gun controls the battle. The squad is caught in the open. In a real firefight, they'd have taken heavy casualties. All right, one dead crowd in the front seat. These men are all professional soldiers, and they know the ambush did not go as planned. But they adapted to the changing circumstances. Line right here. Um, so these two vehicles did what I didn't want them to do. So I had the uh, left side of the assault, assault to vehicle number one over here, and the right side went with me and assault through over here for vehicle two. I gave you guys a very rough operations order, um, just basically a mission. And I saw several times when things screwed up, but you adapted fairly well. Um, I went with the Alpha team. Uh, the demo didn't work. Remember, P stands for plenty. That's one of those things there. When the assault started, we had, uh, divided, good on you, patrol leader, you divided the assault element to take on multiple targets. This was good stuff. Good stuff. Yep. Is there anything you think we need to do better on the next one? Me yeah. and Angela for our team, there was no reason why we couldn't strap double the amount of ammo to our backs. Like, both should have had a, a satchel. That's what I was going to ask. What yeah, yeah. Ask? that's you what I said to you. When we pulled, as soon as I was there, I'm like, P for plenty. <laughs> you know, we aren't used to using these weapons, but that's all a part of, you know. Training and rehearsing. That's, right? that's what it's right. all about. So you guys know to take this back and uh, the weapons you use and the things you do every time. Just keep doing it over and over. Nobody's going to be just as perfect at it. You know, perfect practice makes perfect. It's not just practice makes perfect. You understand that. So, and this was a learning experience, guys. This wasn't a real thing, so we have to be thankful for that. And nobody was hurt. We all came home, right? The men of the first special service force were the elite soldiers of their time. They, too, understood the need for perfect practice. But they also needed action. 
Finally, in the summer of 1943, the unit received battle orders. The Devil's Brigade was going to war. The men had trained in the snow, in the bush, and in the mountains. So the army sent them to sea. Next time on Devil's Brigade, Alaska. The brigade spearheads an invasion to win back American soil. And uh, we were quite prepared that we would lose a lot of people if the Japanese put up the same kind of fight. The drill sergeant from Texas faces his fears. <laughs> hey, attention, I'm falling. I feel like every time I move my feet, I feel like I'm gonna fall and another soldier goes home. He's a really close friend, so for him to leave kind of sucks. That's next time on Devil's Brigade. <laughs>